there was just two inches to spare at either end. A rock quarry in Somerset and yet more vital ingredients for the barrier construction program. The rock was needed to stabilize the riverbed around the piers, a technique that had been pioneered back in Roman times. A rail link from the West Country to South East London operated regularly for several months until thousands of tons had been stockpiled close to the barrier site. Although a remote possibility, the engineers had to consider what would be the effect of a gate failing to rise. If it did, then the water rushing through a single opening could undermine the foundation of a pier. Heavy rock on the riverbed was the answer. Dutch experts, with their vast knowledge of reclamation work, were recruited to tackle the job using special barges and lifting machinery. But the rocks needed to rest on some riverbed foundation, otherwise they would just sink further into the mud. So a huge mattress was made from Norfolk reeds. Underwater, the reeds do not deteriorate, as the Romans discovered. And their methods are still effective by today's standards. First, the mattress was sunk by the weight of rocks. Once it was on the riverbed, then larger rocks could be lowered into predetermined positions. Companies large and small throughout Britain and Europe have contributed to the barrier project. It was British Steel's responsibility to forge the huge steel trunnion shafts. These are bolted to the piers and each designed to carry an end load of around 4,500 tonnes. At every stage in the building of the barrier, designers and engineers have needed to work with critical accuracy. None more so than the steel men of Sheffield, where the gate cylinders were shaved and polished to within a thousandth of a millimetre. The responsibility of building the gates was handled by the men from the northeast of England, an area long associated with shipbuilding and heavy engineering. 
Each gate is a series of steel panels all welded together. The four larger gates, each 61 meters wide, have a box girder design to make them lighter. But they must hold back the full force of a tidal surge. And that was where the experts of the Imperial College of Science and Technology fitted into the story. In the early 70s, experts at the college developed a thorough program of gate testing by building a one-sixth model of a gate. It was tested to destruction, and the results confirmed that a steel box girder design would hold back the Thames. Building the gates was one achievement, getting them to Woolwich was another. They were floated down on pontoons, although the weather had a lot to say about this. Postponements were frequent. The wind and the tides had no respect for engineering schedules. And there were other problems which frustrated the engineers. A dispute on Teesside prevented some of the gates being delivered on time. Once again, the completion date looked in jeopardy. But the situation was resolved, and finally, all the gates were on site. By the early 80s, the barrier had taken a distinctive shape, and the installation of the machinery and gate arms went ahead. The most noticeable feature was the stainless steel cladding on each of the piers, emphasizing its dramatic and distinctive style. The overall design has, not surprisingly, been compared with the Opera House in Sydney, Australia. In many ways, the principle of the gate arm mechanism is classically simple. But their smooth operation relies on highly precise mechanical tolerances and extremely sophisticated hydraulics. Cast iron weights in the cellular gate arm wheels balance the mass of each gate leaf to reduce load on the operating machinery. The task of raising and lowering the gate is also eased by vents and flaps. This allows the structure to be free flooding, equalizing the internal water level with the river upstream. It takes about 12 minutes to rotate the gates. October the 31st, 1982, all the barrier gates were put in the defence position for the first time, and London had at last got the protection it desperately needed. Although the barrier was by now operational, the whole scheme was far from complete. There was a lot of activity in the labyrinth of tunnels and stairwells. Altogether, enough cabling to stretch from London to Manchester was required. All the lighting and the electrical circuits and systems needed to be installed and linked to the main control tower. Then it had to be meticulously checked and tested. The guarantee of London's safety is built into a panel that certainly fits the space age image.
The capital has also got an added bonus, a new tourist attraction. A cruise down the river will now take in the Thames Barrier. On the southern bank, there's a cafeteria and a souvenir shop, as well as an audio-visual theatre showing the history of the project. And it's also a good talking point over a pint of beer in a riverside pub. It's probably true to say that Londoners never realised just how close they were to a major disaster. After centuries of discussion and argument, a decision was taken, and the barrier was built, just in time. The Thames Barrier story is littered with moments of triumph and despair, frustration, agony, and even tragedy. Men did die in accidents on the site. That's the grim side of this otherwise successful story. The river itself is a great attraction, but it can be unpredictable, often showing its teeth on dark winter nights. The tidal surges will continue to come upriver each year, but the barrier will turn them back. The Thames has been tamed.